Hey guys, today I'll show you a horror film named Prince of Darkness. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. In the dimly lit room, an elderly pastor dies alone. Upon hearing the news, the bishop hurries to the scene, only to find two mementos left by the pastor, a box and a handwritten notebook. The elderly pastor was actually the guardian priest of an old church, and they all needed to find a successor before their deaths. However, he had not yet found one and passed away silently in the dead of night. Later, the bishop discovers a key inside the box. He takes the key to the old church, walks through the dimly lit corridor, and opens a door leading to the basement. There, he encounters a mysterious phenomenon. He writes a letter to a nun, asking her to seek out the physicist, Byrak, and request his help in finding out the truth. Byrak is an atheist, specializing in the study of quantum physics. Lately, too many strange things have been happening in Los Angeles. The animals become unusually agitated, and the sun and moon shining together during the day. Although Byrak has noticed, he cannot fathom the reason. He meets with the bishop at the church. The elderly pastor had lived in the old church for 30 years, and he went to the basement every day. Inside was a somber and eerie structure, built by the Spanish government in the 16th century. Very few people know what secrets lie within. Even the bishop is visiting for only the second time. He guides Byrak to the innermost depths, where they find a brightly lit corridor holding a container of swirling green substance, unclear if it's a liquid or some form of life. Beside the container is a book of scriptures, with text in various languages. The original text appears to have been altered multiple times, with traces of editing and deletion. Byrak cannot understand the text and asks the bishop what the container holds. The bishop mysteriously reveals a secret to him. A month ago, the earth and sky exhibited strange phenomena, which are related to some kind of mysterious power. Byrak is baffled by the explanation, but he has witnessed the anomalies, and so he agrees to the bishop's request to investigate. After that, he gathers several student researchers to help with his investigation. This is a very tempting proposition for students. On the day they move into the old church, Byrak sees a woman on the sidewalk, acting strangely, worshipping the sun non-stop. Two ants crawl on her face, but she seems completely unaware. In the evening, Byrak meets with the bishop, who angrily admonishes him not to doubt their upcoming research, as it will strengthen the mysterious power. It is unlike anything they've ever seen before. It exists within atoms invisible to the naked eye. Therefore, this power is omnipresent. To weaken the power, the scriptures must be translated into a book, and then, through Byrak's scientific proof, convince the general public of its existence. Byrak thinks the priest is making a big deal out of nothing, since the power might have been sealed away for 2,000 years. In those two millennia, the world has been calm and peaceful, so the power should not pose a threat now. However, the bishop says that the power can no longer be sealed away. Not long after, those participating in the research arrive at the old church one by one, and various equipment is moved in. At the same time, they notice something strange. Many expressionless pedestrians gather around the church, watching them intently like zombies. When the bishop comes and wonders about it, he almost bumps into a woman who suddenly appears behind him. The woman praises his decision to reopen the church and bows to kiss his hand. But the bishop notices the bottle in the woman's hand filled with wriggling maggots and a small piece of unidentifiable white flesh. This makes the bishop feel uneasy, but he doesn't have time to dwell on these details. After entering the old church, he leads the researchers to see the green jar in the basement. He feels that the jar is absorbing energy from its surroundings. The researchers need to act quickly. They initially want to open the jar to take samples for experiments, but to no avail. The jar has a peculiar sealing system that can only be opened from the inside. At the same time, they discover the earthworms mysteriously cover the window glass. After translating the Latin text in the scriptures, it turns out to be a calculus equation, which hadn't even been known by humans 2,000 years ago. What's more, the content translated from the scriptures tells that Satan will rule the world. This makes Byrak realize that things are not that simple. He dares not announce this news to the public. That night, the researchers were resting, with the animated show Tom and Jerry playing on TV. It was the episode Heavenly Puss, in which Tom's soul leaves his body after being crushed by a heavy object. But because he didn't receive Jerry's forgiveness in time, he couldn't board the train to heaven and was cast into hell, suffering the punishment of being fried in boiling oil. This scene was actually a warning to the researchers, but no one thought about it that way. 
They were more concerned about the strange people gathered outside the church. Researcher Kelly observed them for an entire day, finding that they repeated the same actions every 20 minutes as if suffering from chronic schizophrenia. Kelly wasn't feeling well either. She had injured her arm in the afternoon, and now she got a bruise and her skin was also aching. Her colleagues thought that it would get better with time. However, things quickly took a turn for the worse. A researcher was on his way home when he saw a crucifix with a dead pigeon tied to it at the corner of a staircase. At that moment, a homeless man approached from outside the alley carrying a bicycle frame in his hand. The researcher tried to turn back, but found his way blocked by a group of people. He had no choice but to retreat in the direction of the homeless man, only to be impaled by the bicycle frame, dying in the quiet night. Researcher Brian went to find Byrak. They had completed the first round of experiments and discovered that the substance inside the jar was growing and self-reorganizing, similar to virus mutations. But he wanted to know what kind of experiment he was involved in. So he asked Byrak to tell the truth, or else they couldn't continue the experiment. Byrak handed him a piece of paper which was related to the Book of Revelation. Byrak called for a meeting with everyone. Based on the deciphered content, the theologian outlined some of the history recorded in the scriptures. It said that before the birth of mankind, there was a divine being said to be Satan's father. He was banished to the dark world while Satan was sealed inside a jar. The jar had been burnt in ancient times, but unfortunately not destroyed. The researchers analyzed the corrosion on the jar, dating it back approximately six million years. It was said that Satan was an alien race from another planet, but with a human appearance. At the time, only Jesus had discovered the truth, but no one believed his words. They even killed Jesus. Jesus' disciples then concealed the truth, passing the secret down from one guardian priest to another until human science could prove Jesus' claims. Now, this alien race had awakened. While Byrak was busy with the meeting, researcher Susan found that the droplets in the jar were floating upwards, forming a pool of water on the ceiling. To her surprise, when she approached for a closer look, the jar suddenly sprayed liquid, all of which poured into Susan's mouth. After struggling in pain, Susan's eyes became empty, and she turned into a zombie-like figure, similar to the homeless people outside the old church. Byrak noticed the anomaly later. Brian detected a wave of energy, which could instantly travel through space and manipulate people's minds. This indicated that the alien race inside the jar possessed intelligence far beyond that of humans. Worried that it might cause panic, Byrak told Brian to keep quiet about it. Unfortunately, this could not prevent the situation from escalating. Not long after, another researcher while searching for Susan had his neck snapped from behind. At the same time, the temperature in the entire church dropped. However, despite all these strange occurrences, some people still didn't believe the bishop's words, suspecting that Byrak was playing a joke on them. But when he was alone outside, a row of scavengers suddenly appeared behind him, and Susan stood on the floor above, staring at him with her hollow eyes. Cockroaches crawled on Susan's hands. When the man looked away, he saw his feet were covered in cockroaches, crawling all over him. Before he could even move, a woman with a pair of scissors rushed over, thrusting the sharp blades into his body. At this moment, the theologian found a warning clue in the scriptures and looked at the symbols, but didn't understand their meaning. Then, someone had a dream, where a voice said that they could only communicate through dreams when humans were asleep. However, the sleeping person suddenly woke up, interrupting the dream. The theologian also had the same dream when he went to rest, and even Byrak was no exception. The voice in the dream told Byrak to stop the evil power. Byrak thought he was hallucinating, but the bishop told him that it was real. Anyone who approached the area would have the dream, like the guardian priests, whose dreams were the same every day. Unfortunately, those dreams couldn't be recorded. The theologian was attacked in her sleep. Susan crawled onto her bed and sprayed a liquid into her mouth to make her remain conscious. The others noticed someone was missing and searched for them throughout the church. However, they didn't discover their colleague lying next to the jar. A drop of disgusting liquid fell from the ceiling and landed in the corpse's mouth. This seemed to be a sign of the body coming back to life. Meanwhile, researcher Catherine and Kelly were chatting. Catherine noticed a strange mark on Kelly's bruised arm, which was identical to the symbols in the scriptures. Unfortunately, neither of them had seen the symbol before, so they didn't pay much attention to it. Kelly went back to her room to sleep. She encountered a researcher, Nerd, who informed her of a meeting. 
Nerd also informed the theologian, but the latter seemed not to hear him and quickly typed on the keyboard. The screen was occupied by one sentence, I'm still alive. As Nerd approached, the words on the screen changed, saying that no one would come to save her. Nerd didn't understand the connection between the two sentences. By the time he realized the danger, Susan had already closed the door. The theologian knocked him out from behind, and then Susan fed him the liquid. Byrak noticed that the number of people at the meeting had decreased. He didn't dwell on it too much, and started talking about the dreams people had while sleeping. Those dreams were not subconscious images, but seemed like pre-recorded messages being broadcast. It was similar to a kind of precognitive information. In quantum mechanics, there are superluminal particles whose speed is faster than light. It can travel through time back to the present, sending messages from the future to the past. So he thought that future scientists had launched a superluminal particle signal before Earth was occupied. Those signals connected with human brainwaves, forming the current dreams to tell people the apocalyptic future. However, when everyone started considering this idea, the signal in the church was suddenly cut off. Outside stood a man who had been stabbed with scissors, repeating a greeting word. It seemed as if the alien beings were communicating with the researchers through him. Everyone crowded at the window, hearing the man say that humans should pray for death. This was the declaration of war from the alien beings, but the researchers didn't grasp the message. They saw the man's body covered in cockroaches, which devoured him until only his clothes were left. Then, Nerd walked stiffly to the meeting room door, humming a song with a creepy smile on his face. He then broke the stair railing and used the wood to slit his own throat. Although they performed first aid on Nerd, they couldn't save his shitty life. Byrak and others tried to escape, but they didn't realize the main door had been blocked and they were all trapped in the church. Meanwhile, Susan and the theologian moved the jars from the basement to Kelly's bedside. When their colleague went to look for Kelly, he saw the liquid in the jar dripping upward into the ceiling, then flowing along the ceiling into Kelly's eyes and mouth. He was too scared to even breathe. When he finally reacted, he noticed Susan standing nearby. He was so frightened that he fell to the ground. Another colleague came to join him, but they were injected with the liquid by the theologian, who apparently became a traitor and served the alien beings. The bishop hid in a nearby room to save his big life, while the colleague took the opportunity to hide in the storeroom. These walking dead gathered but didn't break down doors, as they were all waiting for the ritual to be completed on Kelly. At this time, Kelly was still asleep, but her body was filled with green liquid, causing her belly to swell immensely. When dawn came, her skin seemed to be scalded and burnt, covered in terrifying spots. At this point, Catherine heard her colleague's voice and discovered that he was hiding next door. To save him, everyone took turns drilling holes in the wall because there was a window connected to an alley which might allow them to escape. The controlled people stood at both ends of the alley. To determine whether these people were aggressive, Brian jumped out of the window. Unexpectedly, as soon as he landed, the walking dead suddenly started to move, forcing Brian to climb his badass back up. In the bishop's room, Nerd violently pushed open the door, forcing the bishop to hide in a corner, trembling with fear. However, Nerd didn't attack him, but stood in front of the mirror, laughing in pain. He seemed to still have his own consciousness, but was tormented because he couldn't control himself. The evening came soon, and Nerd was still struggling in front of the mirror, and Kelly's condition worsened, with the burns on her body becoming more severe. Byrak looked at the hard-working ant and thought about their controlled colleagues. He believed that Satan could control simple creatures, but humans were chosen because Satan needed more complex beings to complete the transformation. When the colleague relayed Kelly's situation, Byrak realized she had already been chosen. In Catherine's memory, the symbols on Kelly's body had appeared in astrology books. They were markings used for casting spells in the Middle Ages. Unfortunately, knowing the truth now was too late. Satan had already taken over Kelly's body, wanting to release its father from the Dark World. So, the possessed Kelly ordered to assault Byrak and the others. These attackers moved sluggishly and were not as violent as Susan when she first mutated. They only knew how to spray the evil liquid when they saw people. As a result, one was blinded and another was beaten by the colleague and thrown out the window. The possessed Susan was thrown out as well to meet Jesus. Satan didn't care about its followers at all. It saw a makeup mirror on the ground which could be used to enter the dark world. However, the mirror was too small, not enough for it to summon its fat father. In anger, it smashed the mirror. 
At this moment, it sensed Nerd's consciousness, knowing that there was a full-length mirror in the next room. This object was almost as tall as an adult, completely capable of rescuing its father. Therefore, it stood in front of the mirror and stretched its withered arm into the mirror. Upon seeing this, the bishop quickly picked up a fire axe and chopped off Satan's satanic hand. Unexpectedly, its hand could regenerate. The bishop then tried to chop its head, hoping to send him straight to meet Jesus, but the head could also be reattached back. Satan trapped the bishop between the cabinet and the wall, continuing to summon its father. It touched a hand in the darkness and was about to drag it out when Catherine appeared behind it. Although Catherine was terrified, she fearlessly pounced on the possessed Kelly, falling into the mirror with it to the dark world on the other side. After the two disappeared, the bishop threw the axe, not a grenade, to shatter the mirror into pieces. As a result, Satan was finally sent to hell and unable to return, but Catherine also vanished from the living world. All the corpses controlled by Satan shut down, and the walking dead outside the church dispersed on their own. After the incident, Birak saw Brian in the church, staring blankly at the mirror shards, comforting him by saying that the shards were nothing to fear. The sacrifices of those people were predestined, and they gave their lives to expel evil, dying with value. However, Satan and its satanic father were still waiting for them on the other side. It didn't really disappear. After returning to the university dormitory, Brian had a dream, which was about that broadcast message, a voice claiming to be from 1999, telling Brian to stop the evil power. But standing in the old church's doorway was no longer the future scientist, but Catherine's figure. Brian suddenly woke up from the dream, but before he could recover, he turned his head to see Catherine sleeping beside him. He woke up after the dream within a dream. He then looked at the mirror in the bedroom, reaching out his hand to touch the mirror, indicating that the portal to the dark world might still exist. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.